Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Pseudo Show, where business meets open source, a proud member of the Tux Digital Network. My name is Bill, and alongside me, quite literally, Hi. is Neil, and virtually is Brandon. How are you guys? I'm doing great. It's been a while, but here we are. And just... uh. Lots of stuff has happened. That's an understatement. I, today, today, uh, today's topic is you know kind of reflects a lot. Really, a uh, our uh, whole the whole uh, which ha- it's had a whole a huge impact to our ecosystem in in enterprise in enterprise IT and enterprise application development. So. I'll, well, I'll let you guys uh, start kicking this off, but uh, yeah, Broadcom, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> so as everybody knows, VMware was recently purchased by Broadcom, and that purchase has affected every member of the technology community, either directly or indirectly. It's affected large enterprise, medium business, small business, channel partners, MSPs, distributors, retailers, and really everybody kind of in the supply chain in different ways. So today's episode is how does it affect the space that we are in as the pseudo show, if at all, or people that we know, or perhaps customers that we work with without naming names, of course. Yeah. I can tell you from my end that as a managed services provider, primarily in the Microsoft space, of course. The VMware acquisition of Broadcom has raised questions about what other alternatives are out there to VMware, whether they are open source or commercial. And so we're starting to have those conversations with our clients that are on VMware and explore what other alternatives are out there. And maybe, Neil, you might have some insight into what alternatives you've seen since that news release first I mean, honestly, broke. like, this has also been, like, the biggest thing that's kind of affected me and, and the people I've talked to has been the the most recent announcement of the loss of the, the hobbyist and VM uh, user group, the VMware user group, you know, free tier stuff that allowed a lot of people to become enthusiasts and 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 learn and leverage the platform and bring it into, into the business spaces. And that's turned into questions of like, well, so what do we, what do we look at for for replacing this or supplanting this in these in these models? And uh, you know, the the main things I've I've kind of like guided people towards is asking the first the question of what what type of virtualization workload are you looking at? Because like right now we're mostly looking at ESXi and the loss of those things, but also. You know, Broadcom is currently working on trying to sell the end user um, virtualization group, which includes VMware Workstation and VMware Fusion. So people have been asking similar questions about those. Um, from that perspective, I've kind of pointed toward people towards, you know, across the strata of desktop and single server workloads. Um, I've kind of pointed people towards um, GNOME boxes historically, although recently there was. Um, I think like a week ago, an announcement about, uh, well, a week ago at the time of this recording, so fairly recently, of a company doing a port of the virtual box uh, software to run on top of KVM. And while that makes it effectively Linux only, that's great for Linux desktop usage. That's also great for headless Linux usage if if you're really if you need the the um, virtual box compatible virtual machines. Such as with Vagrant, or if you're doing, you know, headless virtual box and stuff like that. Um, from that perspective, virtual box KVM is an option because you drop the most unreliable part of virtual box, which is its host drivers, that can create serious stability issues. And you are now using the built-in hypervisor code in the Linux kernel for that. Um, then again, going further along the strata, and we're going between workstation and you know, single server type workloads. Um, Cockpit has built-in management for virtual machines that you can, as, you can use locally and remotely. So you can create virtual machines 
both traditional style where you install it with an installer ISO and go through it, as well as being able to use cloud virtual machines that typically are used in, in the public cloud and private cloud infrastructure, you can import those into cockpit and then you initialize them the same way you would in a cloud environment and be able to set up you know, Windows or Linux virtual machines um, using cockpit. So you know, that strata, I think, covers like all the way from the desktop case into the single server case where you would typically see VMware ESXi, you would see VMware Workstation, and maybe sometimes you'd see a sprinkling of Hyper-V. There have been some concerns about Microsoft Hyper-V as well um, as Microsoft pushes more towards Azure Stack HCI for virtualization workloads. Um, so going into that strata and then pass that into the multi-server strata, um, I think we the, the main thing I tend to kind of push people towards is looking at um, either if you want to be more cloud-centric um, OpenShift virtualization or Harvester are good choices here. They're both built on top of KubeVirt and use Kubernetes APIs, which allows you to tap into that ecosystem of Kubernetes stuff. And then if you are not interested in that space, if you're in the more um, traditional type of virtual, virtual infrastructure, um, XCPNG with Zen Orchestra tends to be like kind of where I make people look towards because the Zen, the Citrix Zen server, server ecosystem still exists and it's all fully compatible with the XCP and Zen Orchestra stuff. And so there's some ecosystem power here that you can leverage and scale and build upon. You can also get uh, enterprise support for XCPNG and the Zen Orchestra platform, as well as Proxmox. Let's not forget that their community also has a hypervisor that is web-based, readily accessible, and does incorporate enterprise features such as Gluster, Ceph, and other connections into that kind of storage environment. But what I want to know more about is this relationship between OpenShift and virtualization. Because when I think OpenShift, when I think Kubernetes, I think containers, and I put that in its own container, for lack of a better word, over here, and virtual machines live over here. I know in the Proxmox world, from my time using it, I can leverage LXC containers on the same host that I can Proxmox, but I've never looked at using a product like OpenShift or OKD as a hypervisor. So, Brandon, since you have a lot of experience with OpenShift, can you Give me a little bit of guidance or a 30 yeah. second tour on how that kind of works. So, essentially, because you're, what this is allowing you to do is to manage it's in this case, it's purely a management construct. Manage your containers, your Kubernetes pods, and virtual machines, which happen to be running in a pod in the same platform. That, that's I think I really, follow. That's really the main thing. You, and it's because it's just leveraging KVM underneath the covers, you get the same benefits as, K, as uh, any other KVM hypervisor, but you're getting the management of uh, capabilities of OpenShift and are able to leverage the OpenShift and Kubernetes ecosystem. Now that OpenShift is now probably one of the top platforms for this space. It's a growing ecosystem. So backup vendors, uh, I, other ISVs, like whether that's like a database vendors, network, uh, network functions, whatever, pick your app. It's going. It's landing on OpenShift. It's being certified on OpenShift, whether if that's in containers or in virtual machines, because a lot of customers that have been utilizing KVM, whether if that was Red Hat virtualization or Overt or OpenStack, are now targeting OpenShift and, and KubeVirt for virtualized workloads, and in some ways, in my opinion. It's much better than it was previously because ISVs actually want to run 
their workloads on OpenShift versus trying to get it certified on Red Hat virtualization or other things. That was one of the, like, that was, that's been, I think, the biggest problem of adoption of alternatives to VMware up until now is ecosystem. Like, it's never been about features. It's all about the ecosystem around the platform. And OpenShift has an ecosystem that, uh, in my opinion, rivals, or at least starting to rival, the VMware ecosystem. I remember VMware dipping their toes into the Kubernetes space not too long ago. So are, are you saying that the positioning of OpenShift is going to allow VMware customers to get sort of a similar experience if they were in the Kubernetes plus the virtualization platform? In my opinion, a better experience. <laughs> but it it's because uh, I mean, mostly because you're not going to several different tools. Right, that's that's the uh, advantage. It's uh, OpenShift. It's one one stop shop for containers, for virtualization, as well as your um, monitoring, your alerting, because it's all there in the platform. That's great for covering the large scale, clustered, enterprise grade clients. Because with the, from what I understand, then the 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 idea of clustering your VMs becomes as simple as clustering a pod, if I'm correct. It'll be very similar to a pod. And the, and the same concept goes for any other Kubert-based solution. So this goes for Harvester as well. Like Harvester is going to be able to utilize the Kubernetes ecosystem uh, as well as the Rancher ecosystem that, that's around it, and which is, of course, growing because Brett Rancher is a very popular platform as well. Both solutions are really good at the small, at the small cluster or, or the large cluster. Like There are architectures for both solutions, for single node, three node, and of course, the uh, N plus one node uh, uh, cluster architecture. I actually regret wiping out OpenShift on one of my servers now because I had OpenShift working and it was running, except I didn't know really how to use it. So as somebody who has a home lab and a hobbyist who wants to grow into that space, I may reconsider putting that on one of my servers where I may have traditionally just reverted back to VMware or Prox or something else. I feel like what we're encountering now because of this is more of a paradigm shift in how we view the role of virtual machines versus the role of containers. They are becoming more and more of one of the same. Maybe not one and the same, but definitely something that uh, enterprises especially want to manage together they don't necessarily want to manage them separately and uh what what i like about the the paradigm whether if we're talking what i'll just go with a kubevert platform you're now leveraging your kubernetes talent across these domains and now you have your virtualization admins that are now needing to get up to speed on newer technology uh, that they may not have been exposed to before. And and the thing is, though, is it is a different skill set. Like, that's actually probably the biggest challenge right now for everyone in this space is the skill set to manage a Kubert platform is very different from managing VMware. A lot of VMware admins come from a Windows background. And I I say this all the time whenever I talk about Kubernetes. It's a it's a Linux application. Simple as that. And so you need to have Linux skills as well as the skills to run the Kubernetes application on top of Linux. So 
again, two different skill sets, but those skill sets are uh, now need to, in some ways, come together because you're going to need Windows admins that need to understand the platform that's running on. So if you have a Windows virtual machine running on OpenShift virtualization, they need to understand the, the I least, I think they do. They need to understand the platform it's running on. Just like they would have needed to know VMware and their CLI and their APIs and their configuration tools uh, versus just running things in standard Hyper-V or, or another platform. And that's great for the enterprise space, but I think there's this big gap, especially in the small mom and pop shops up to kind of the midsize where they look at a product like an OpenShift and say, it's really nice, but might be a bit out of my budget. What other alternatives are there for me out there? And I feel like that's where maybe a nascent open source company could come in and say, we have you covered. We have a product that's designed for you know, the single server node all the way up to maybe five or 10 servers and it will cover backups, it will cover clustering, it will cover reporting, monitoring, but you don't have to pay the a hefty upfront cost or ongoing subscription. I'm really curious to see if either of you guys know of anybody out there that might be either starting to create a solution for this, or do we know of anybody that already has a solution for this that I, I just don't happen to know Nutanix's about? basically Nutanix's space, right? Like this is... This is something that if you if you look at either Nutanix or you look at um, at XCP and XOA, right? Like those are that's basically the playground where they live in. Like both of them obviously can scale way up for sure. That's totally a thing. But their sweet spot tends to be in that gap between the single spot and the super scaling, or as we now call it, hyperscaling, because. We need to have hyperboles or hyper or something. I don't know. Like using hyper for everything seems to have become in vogue. I know 10 years ago we called it super scaling, whatever. Anyway, as you go between those that strata, you tend to see a lot of these platforms that work well in the what I like to call the five, the 10 to 100 node range. And in that 10 to 100 node range, you tend to see a different set of choices made for optimizing how you manage stuff. That means they're still graphical first. They're still human interaction first. They obviously still have instrumentation and APIs and all these other things, but there's a lot more attention given towards the human-based interaction because at a small enough scale, you're probably manually doing stuff still. Um, and so details are taken, or, you know, attention is paid to make sure that that manual management experience is good. And while the experiences with Zen server-based platforms that in my, in my history have been hit or miss, um, I won't deny that I think those are the platforms that tend to spend a lot more effort towards trying to do that sort of thing. The main gap, I think all of these platforms have, these alternatives have, you know, Brandon, you mentioned throwing Windows VMs inside of OpenShift virtualization. I mean, throwing the, you know, throwing the pin into that, into that needle, right? It's, that's a big problem because Windows support is very poor um, for a lot of these platforms when you're talking about how modern Windows is more composited, more GPU heavy in terms of the basics, like the basic interaction models for Windows over the past 10 years has become more GPU oriented out of the gate. And so when you run them in virtual machines, the performance really suffers because para-virtualized GPU drivers for Windows have just really not been developed for these alternative platforms because a lot of them have been very Linux-focused for a very long time. And so I think that's going to be one of those key feature things that are going to have to be required to build out to, to be able to take on all these workloads effectively. Yeah, now now the now that this is happening, maybe maybe we'll start seeing some more contribution to this uh, from whether that's from Red Hat, Nutanix. So, I mean, the Nutanix hypervisor Acropolis is actually a key, and it uses Bird just like everybody based. else does. This, yeah, so I, I'd like to see 
some contributions there. I think the big issue uh, that you're getting to is virtual desktop. Like whenever I'm thinking about this stuff, it it's always I forget about virtual desktops. I'm going to be perfectly honest. I I do. Um, it, it's never top of my mind. I'm always thinking about uh, ver- data cent- like traditional data center application virtualization versus the versus virtual desktops. Whenever I'm thinking about about this, because KVM, that's what everyone essentially uses it for. Yeah, obviously, Nutanix, their part of their big bread and butter is VDI. Like they, that's uh, one of the big things that they do, partnering with Citrix uh, and others to bring a to to deliver that experience. And frankly, when they got into the market, I felt that's what hyperconverged was really good for was for VDI. Uh, Obviously, that that is well matured in hyperconverged platforms. I I that to me is now a standard architecture for everything. Uh, it, it's fine to do to run your database now on a hyperconverged architecture. It's totally fine. It works great um, in most use cases. <laughs> uh, preface that star <laughs> but the so that that is a good point i i don't know how well that's going to work going forward like the a lot of the uh, reason why it, i think this is stalled is because there isn't a display protocol that's being actively developed for uh open source virtualization Open source, rather open source VDI. I uh, that being Spice, like Spice has been, I think it's gotten some development recently, but it's not a lot, quite frankly. So something has to come in and take that take that place until then, or just still develop the driver and have a proprietary display protocol that can take advantage of the pair of virtualized drivers or be able to do the rendering on the client side, uh, like uh, a PC over IP. I mean, another aspect of this that makes pair virtualized GPU stuff important is AIML, right? You've got to be able to access those. you got to be able to pair virtualize that so that you yeah. can do things like run OpenCL properly. And so it's going to become yeah. increasingly important well, to be able to handle you. that. That's true for both Windows and Linux. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thankfully, there are drivers for Linux that work fairly well, at least with AMD. And in the case of NVIDIA, that, that's just a different animal I don't even want to talk about in this. That's a, I can go on that for hours, uh, but that's a, that's a different different animal to tackle. I did forget one other part of this that we should probably briefly mention is that as you go into this quote unquote superscaler or hyperscale choices where you get into thousands of nodes, there is another option other than OpenShift virtualization or its free alternative OKD virtualization. And that is OpenStack. Your lovely friend OpenStack, Brandon. I, did. Uh, I can now run OpenStack on top of OpenShift. So uh, it's now a workload on OpenShift, which does make, actually, I have played with this recently. It makes it, makes OpenStack much easier to implement, at least to get going. I mean, obviously, like there's a lot of day two things that are still going to be OpenStack hard. Um. But getting a cluster going, and this is going to probably be it as uh, MSPs that were doing like cloud style hosting on top of VMware. Maybe they want to take a look at OpenStack to to do that uh, to to replace it. I don't know. Like I, I don't know what that really is going to look like. That that's still fresh news. 
But OpenStack is definitely a good alternative in that space. But again, asterisks, you need the talent to handle it. It's a uh, OpenStack. Again, it's a Linux application. Uh, but <laughs> there are complexities in OpenStack that unless you've been working on it for years are that will drive many people crazy. I'm not going to dance around that in my, I think OpenStack is a great platform if it's ran well, if it's not ran well, OpenStack is a nightmare. It, it's a really. I could say that. Probably say the same thing about. I think that's any also true about any Kubernetes-based like platforms. Whether, like it's really easy but, to do them wrong. Like, and I have plenty of experience. Yeah, it's you know over the past I don't know ten years of my professional career doing both Kubernetes and OpenStack wrong a lot, and figuring out what is actually wrong and then doing it right the next time. So it's. I think it's true with any of these sufficiently non-trivial platforms like. You can also screw up Zen Server and XCP, and you can you can screw up all, all you can screw, you can up, screw VMware. up VMware. You can absolutely screw up so, VMware. Yeah. Oh, I've I, done that many times. I, I have it, broken more VMware it, it, installations yeah. than I care to count. Yeah. My point is, is like it, it's easy to break if you are not familiar with the platform. Like what? Like with VMware, like. When I first started using it in 2006, I want to say, I think that's the first time I used VMware. It, it a lot of it was just point and click. Yeah, there were some things I had to do on the CLI, but for the most part, it was point and click. I have you beat. I started using VMware in 2002. I have both of you beat. I started using VMware in 1998. That's how long I've worked with VMware and across. Various instances, I, I'm sure both of you maybe remember VMware Server. Up until uh, version 2.0, you could install it on top of a Linux distribution of your choice, and you was, had a fully working hypervisor. Yeah, yeah that's right. GSX. That was the GSXi, which then got killed off as ESXi became popular. I don't think it had the... No, the I, I came later. The, the I, I refers uh, to the vSphere integration yeah. stuff that came much later. Because, uh, nah, if my memory is right, ESX without the I, it was basically the hypervisor was like, yeah, a gig it, well, in it was size. just if you did ESX and then ESXi went well, down to like a hundred. The big difference like between could, ESX and ESXi was where the split lie in what was included in the base platform, right? So when we moved towards ESXi, a lot of stuff moved out of the hypervisor platform and moved into the appliance. And so while the hypervisor itself got smaller, the overall install like tripled in size. So because you had to install the integrated appliance that went on top to make it work. Anyway, that's a digression that actually doesn't really matter for the purposes of this discussion, other than we're all old and we did this when it was, when it was all new. My question is, as an MSP, or even having been an IT director in other careers, is the migration plan and path to get my workloads from VMware into something else? Like, what that's does that even begin bad. to look like? like it's pretty like, trivial. That's been a very days. well understood thing for a long time. Like, a very simple, like, you want to do this manually one to one type case is that there's a tool from, uh, I think it's from LibGuestFest called. Uh, vert v to v which allows you to connect one virtualization platform to another and move the machines over and then automatically adjust the machine after it's been copied for the target hypervisor so for example i used to use this for moving things from um, when i had stuff on gsx moving it over to um overt way 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 back in the day and vert v to v would connect to the vmware hypervisor and it would connect to the KVM hypervisor on libvirt that powered over it, and it would copy the machines over. Then it would boot up the machines in the target environment and edit them to swap out the VMware guest editions for the, the vert IO ones, or back then they were called the KVM guest editions. And 
and go from there. So that process is actually fairly well understood at this point. Um, there are a number of command line utilities. There are scripts. There are helper tools. There's even like Ansible playbooks and stuff like that for doing that. So that one's actually not too bad. Yeah. Yeah. And they all, uh, most of them use the uh, libguest FS tools. So uh, for B2B, as Neil mentioned, some of the stuff that I used to do, this is actually before Vert V2V. So uh, there's a tool inside of VirtualBox, actually, that will convert a VMDK to QCOW2. And it will, uh, and just like Vert V2V, it will remove things like VMware tools. And, uh, but then you can boot it up and install the dry, all the necessary drivers that you need. So, Definitely tons of tools out there to uh, to tackle that. <laughs> well, one area that I also think is worth discussing involving VMware is how tightly it was integrated into backup partners. Yeah. Veeam, Acronis, Bacula, there's a bunch of them out there. And even baked into most NAS solutions, such as Synology or QNAP, are tooling to connect to your local VMware installations. I'm really curious what that's going to look like now because that tooling is, in my, to my the best of my knowledge, doesn't exist when you're connecting to, let's say, a single CentOS server that's running KVM with in cockpit. virtual machines. Yeah. So that's probably going to be more difficult um, out of the gate. I, a lot of that was built for this that hobbyist market uh, that the uh, the VM user groups were focused around. Um, but now that we'll, we'll we'll have to see what shakes out as the ecosystem adapts to this new norm. I mean, the good news is at least the capabilities are all there inside of Libvirt and 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 Quemu and KVM. So all it takes is people starting to be interested in building stuff out around it. And maybe that's finally going to happen because the impetus is there. People got to do something. Mm -hmm. Do either of you see a shift in deployments, maybe going from on-prem VMware to, let's say, AWS, Azure, GCP, or another public cloud service as a result well, of this. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's going to be a mixed bag, absolutely. though. I don't. I think what's going to happen is you're going to see people reevaluating their entire footprint, and they're going to start thinking about how to reoptimize it. Because the historically, the reason why people don't do this is the sunk cost fallacy, like kicks in, and they make the and it makes it harder for them to reevaluate them. But on the as going basis, they're looking at what are their investments supposed to look like. They're going to take a more critical look at where things make sense in which platform, in which location, and in which uh, and and which kind of management experience do they need. And we'll see how things shake out from there. I think it's going to wind up reinforcing this upcoming trend of having a bifurcated experience based on needs and capabilities that are expected. Like you're going to start seeing people evaluate. All right, what kind of burstability do we need for these workloads? What kind of what kind of maintenance efforts are required for these workloads? What kinds of, you know, things like that. And then they're going to reprice out what the what that's going to look like. I expect that low maintenance, high burstability workloads are probably going to move to the public cloud because that is where they probably are going to maximize the value out of it on ongoing basis. And then the ones that are higher maintenance but lower burstability, they may stay on premises but go to a different platform. There may actually be things that they wind up saying, okay, virtual machines overall doesn't really make sense for this. Let's re architect it to either be bare metal platforms or containerized platforms. You know, these are the kinds of decisions that start getting made because the pressure is now there for them to figure out how to optimize again. So, right now, I, I, I agree. For there's a but it's a we're gonna total reevaluate. I think you did say total reevaluation because I have customers that are completely, not I mean not completely, but they are heavily reconsidering 
their public cloud strategy. So this could just be another uh, this you know reevaluate if they're reevaluating platforms, deciding okay maybe I need to repatriate workloads and data back on prem. Uh, I have customers that are spending millions in egress fees uh, just uh, to access their own data. So it's uh, they'd save that millions <laughs> just by bringing it back to the data centers that they never closed. <laughs> so, One of the things that I like to focus on when a big news event comes out like this is what are the positives that can come from this? And I feel like while this is disruptive for many, there are also a lot of positives that come from this, especially in the open source world. And as we all know, necessity is the mother of invention. I feel like we will start to see a lot of little cottage industry companies pop up that either are there to guide through these kinds of migrations uh, and then either shut down or we'll see system integrators that weren't in this space before that are going to continue ongoing support and services. We may also see companies pop up that say, hey, we know how to do Linux virtualization really well at a smaller scale within your budget. Let's have a conversation and see where we can go from there. So I kind of want to sit back on the couch and eat the popcorn while the movie plays out to see what comes from this. But I do feel like that this will spawn innovation. It will spawn conversations and it will generate discussions about where a company's footprint really lies in that virtualization space. Yeah, I'm actually kind of looking forward to seeing where this leads. Actually, one of the things that I'm uh, try, I want to try out. I uh, actually last night I tried to compile the new uh, VirtualBox KVM uh, solution that that uh, as of this recording, came, I believe it was earlier this week or last week. And because I want to try something, because oh, years ago, this is before uh, Sun was purchased by Oracle, a reference architecture for VirtualBox to do VDI, and it's because of the way it handles RDP, why it made it like a a decent solution for for that use case, and but it performed like crap. It was unreliable due to, well, it's a kernel module that has never been too great in my personal opinion. I, I, I've lo- VirtualBox was great for when I was doing things on a Mac and there, I really didn't want to buy VMware Fusion or Parallels. And so I, like, don't get me wrong, I like VirtualBox a lot, uh, but I, do want to see how I'd like to see how that if I can even replicate that reference architecture now with KVM is that was one of the things I always wanted to be able to do is implement a full fledged, maybe not quite enterprise class, but at least good enough, a uh, virtual, uh, virtual desktop solution with KVM. And I've had not quite good enough but I'd like to get to good enough with uh, uh, the VirtualBox uh, implementation of RDP is awesome, uh, quite frankly. It's one of the things I really like about it. Well, Brandon and Neil, we certainly covered a lot today on a very controversial topic if some people want to think about it that way. But in any event, it's a topic that's affected many, many of us in the technology field. And hopefully what we gain from this is some answers and insight and direction out there for where users, whether they're a single mom and pop shop selling goods to an enterprise client that has a global footprint, no matter which one of those you are or anywhere in between, I'm sure that we're going to find more information and more answers as more information becomes available from Broadcom or from other players in this space. 
So I want to thank both of you for your time today and reviewing this topic here. And it, as always, it's great to catch up with both of you. It's certainly been a certainly been too long since we've all convened. And I want to thank all of you out there that are listening or watching this show uh, for staying tuned to us as always. So to close it out, thank you for watching or listening to the Sudo Show, where business meets open source, a proud member of the Tux Digital community. Thank you.